Good morning. This public meeting of the Investment Committee is being held at 30 North 3rd Street, Harrisburg, PA. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. Although being live streamed via the internet, this meeting is a live, in-person meeting. The live streaming of this meeting is presented as a convenience and is not provided as the official means for public attendance. In the event the live stream fails or cannot be transmitted for any reason, the in-person public meeting will continue without interruption. Please proceed. Thank you. Great. Right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, call to order this uh, June 3, 2022 meeting of the Investment Committee of the Pennsylvania State Employees Retirement System. Uh, Mr. Becker, this is Jim Boom. I just have, uh, wanted to let you know that uh, Alan Flanagan will be sitting for the uh, secretary during the investment committee um, uh, okay. meeting, and he will be in the seat. Sorry to interrupt everybody. Great. Thank you. No, thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Um, may we have a roll call, please, uh, Bill Thomas? I think you're muted, Bill. Yes, Chair Becker. Uh, present. Senator DeSanto. Present. Mr. Philman. Present. President Representative Frankel or Mr. Akko on behalf of Representative Frankel? Uh, this is Mr. Akko. Uh, until Representative Frankel is able to attend later in the meeting, I'll be sitting at a designated. Thank you. Treasurer Garrity. I'm here. Senator Hughes or Mr. Lindsay or Mr. Duncan on behalf of Senator Hughes. This is not Lindsay on behalf of Senator Hughes. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Here. Representative Schemmel. Ms. Boyle or Ms. Vecchio on behalf of Representative Schemmel? This is Jill Vecchio on behalf of Representative Schemmel. He's traveling today, so he is going to try and sign on, but I will be in the seat if he doesn't. All right, thank you. Ms. Soderberg. Here. Secretary Thal. Aye. Or here, excuse me. Mr. Flanagan on behalf of Secretary Vague. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, all present, except. Great. We're all counted for. Thank you. Um, the first order of business is the approval of the minutes of the last meeting. So I move that uh, we approve the minutes of the April 28, 2022 meeting of the Investment Committee uh, as they were submitted. Uh, may I have a second, please? Second. Uh, thank you. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Uh, opposed, no. Hearing none, the motion is passed. Uh, moving on, uh, old business, we have none today. Uh, if we move down to number five under new business, uh, we do have several items to cover, uh, including we'll have an, um, an update on the rebalancing that we have. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Senator DeSanto, could, uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback from somebody. If they could check if they're on mute, some background. It's hard for me to hear you. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. Nope, not, not a problem. But everybody check their speakers, please, or their mics. Okay, we'll, we'll try it again, see how this goes. But uh, under new business, we have several items uh, to cover. And in, including, we'll have an, a, a, an update on the uh, rebalancing uh, that we approved at the last meeting. Uh, we will have quarterly investment performance analysis for the deferred, or through the defined benefit, the deferred compensation, and the defined contribution plans. We will have quarterly updates on both the private equity and the real estate components of the portfolio. And we will have uh, three uh, new opportunities uh, to hear uh, to private equity and one real estate. So with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, CIO Jim Nolan and the investment office team. Thanks, Chair Becker. Appreciate that. 
Uh, we're going to try to follow the previous committee meeting and stay on time or even get done a little bit early. Good. Yep, I figured you'd like that, Chairman. Um, uh, yes, and so well, if I could direct you to uh, 5A and board docs, um, that's the uh, CIO updates. In particular, today we'll be discussing the rebalancing. Uh, 5A rebalancing update is the name of the document, uh, also being uh, live streamed uh, here. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Kelly or Katie. Um, I'll direct you to page three of that document and cover this very quickly. We just had some uh, realignment to put into place based on the uh, asset allocation modifications that we made. If we go to page three on that, thanks, Katie. Uh, you'll see we were underweight 5% in the large cap, that's our largest category and contributor to return. We're focused on long-term compounding. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's important to keep that uh, range as tight as possible. So you can see we are under by five. The small exposure was over by three, and cash was over by a percent. Uh, the next page, page four, you can see a recap of what happened. Primarily, index funds were involved, low-cost index funds, where we uh, increased uh, exposure by a billion and a half to the large cap exposure, uh, got it closer to target, and then uh, reduced the small cap across all three sleeves that we have, which include two index funds, the, the core index and the value index, and then an active manager. Uh, for 150 million, so that got us closer, uh, as well as the cash that was used, 375 million. Um, sufficient cash was maintained in anticipation of uh, monthly benefit payments and known capital calls that might be occurring. Um, so all that was all taken into account. And uh, once again, if you flip back to page three, please, Katie, uh, you'll see over to the right, the result in the large cap is uh, still about a percent underweight, uh, as well as some of the international exposure. But fixed income is uh, slightly underweight. And the trade-off would be to take fixed income even lower to get the equity in line. So uh, that has not been done yet, but we do have some more uh, implementation steps in the fixed income structure that occurred at the last meeting. Uh, so we're working with Callan um, on executing the rest of that uh, asset allocation implementation, and we'll come back to you uh, in the future on that. Are there any questions on the rebalancing activity that occurred? And we're happy to note, by the way, not that we're market timers, but the, the purchases of the securities did happen to coincide with the lows that occurred about a week and a half. It was just ironic. They hit right at the very low point in the day. Then we had a significant, uh, about a 7% rally last week that we enjoyed off of that $1.5 billion. So it's always nice to have, but again, uh, not something you can plan for. Okay, if there's no questions, then we could move on, please, to uh, the next item on the agenda that Mr. Becker just uh, went through at a high level, and that'll be our performance. We're going to ask um, our friends at Callan to come on. I saw Tom Shingler, so he's present, and we'll be going through those reports. Before Tom goes, uh, though, I would like to ask you to open up uh, under 5B, there's a document labeled DB Plan. It was a Callan DB Plan Executive Summary. Katie, if you can get that up. Tom will be using that anyway, but I'm just going to jump to page 11 for a moment because this is something that we in the investment office uh, focus on, and that's really the longer term uh, activity. And you can see here uh, multiple time periods. I won't walk you through all of them. I do want to point out, though, 
over the last one, three, five, and ten years, the surge portfolio is now above median in all those measurement periods, which is a wonderful enhancement and accomplishment uh, due, due to re revamping our portfolio, um, increasing our exposure to low-cost passive investments and all things considered. And uh, as well, uh, over the three and five year period, uh, so those are those are some significant, it's pretty significant, you know, for consistency, three and five years, uh, the system ended up in the top quartile. So just really thrilled to see those numbers. I, I know Alan Flanagan had pointed them out the last time and the, and the uh, trend has continued. We hope to see that improvement move out further and further over the years as we continue to implement uh, enhancements um, to the portfolio. And with that, uh, unless there's a question on this, uh, okay, uh, Tom, could you take it away and uh, cover the, and, and Tom will be talking at the board meeting more in depth for the whole board uh, in, in that form. I know the whole board is also on the investment committee, but they'll be doing that at the board meeting next week a more in-depth capital market. So in, in uh, taking consideration of time here today, uh, Tom will provide a brief update on the performance at a high level. Get in a little bit deeper next week. So Tom, thanks, take it away. Okay, thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm gonna cover a few key slides and we will spend more time on the capital markets given the volatility and the economic issues we're seeing at the ne the meeting next week. So if you go to slide three, please. I'm just going to go back to that quickly. So this is showing the performance. Uh, one more, please. Thank you. So this is showing the performance of capital markets through uh, the end of the first quarter, and that's the performance period we're measuring here. And markets were down, so we had a couple of key drivers of markets. One was the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which created market volatility and more of a risk off sentiment when you have that kind of geopolitical event. And then the other aspect was the higher than expected inflation that we've been seeing and central banks like the Federal Reserve taking steps to raise interest rates as a result of that. So this was an unusual period in terms of both stocks and bonds being down. We look back at this for almost 100 years and there's been 37 quarters, about 10% of the time when we've had stocks and bonds down together. So it's important to understand they're not perfectly negatively correlated. So the idea that if stocks are up, bonds are going to be down or vice versa, that's not the case in terms of the relationship between stocks and bonds. But generally, uh, you do expect to have more diversification than we saw in the first quarter, but you had those two factors driving markets in terms of both the impact of the Russian invasion of re Ukraine and the consequences for economic growth coupled with the uh, inflation that we're seeing in the rise in interest rates. So from a market perspective, equities were down in the U.S. 5.3% for, for the broad Russell 3000. Non-U.S. markets were for developed markets down 4.8%. Where you saw further declines was in small cap stocks, which tend to be riskier companies, and emerging markets, the riskier non-U.S. companies, and, and bonds were down as well, as I said, of the aggregate down 5.9%. That's the worst return for the aggregate since 1980. And the the positive from there is that you do see uh, better yields today than we, did, we have been seeing, and it does create a better entry point for investors. And then from uh, all, what we'll call alternatives, you'll see private equity has a positive return, but remember that's lagged, so that's showing you returns through the end of last year. And then commodities, uh, strong returns. But it is important to keep in mind that an investor like Service is a long-term investor. You're not investing for a quarter. You're investing for years. This is a multi-generational trust that we're investing for. So we want to look at the long-term numbers. And you can see 
the long-term numbers are much more favorable for these markets. And you see that reflected in SERS's total fund return as well. So if we can go to page uh, six, please. Thank you. This is showing the total fund for SERS as of the end of March, $38.2 billion. It's important to keep in mind that a new application was adopted at the last meeting, and this is not yet reflected because this predates that change in the asset allocation. So overall, the, the assets generally close to target. I'll highlight a couple of key exceptions. One is that from a, uh, an equity perspective, you do see a significant difference between private equity, actual, and target. So 16 versus 12%. The private equity target has been increased, and there's also now a more pronounced denominator effect. So markets have declined since the end of March, and so that means that assets that aren't daily valued that are on a different valuation schedule, their percentage of the total fund is going to move up as a result. But as of the end of March, private equity was at 16% versus the target at that time of 12. And then uh, beyond that, you can see that for other asset classes, it was there were there were some some smaller differences, but still meaningful, including the the underweight to non-U.S. stocks. If we go uh, one slide forward, please. So this is showing a, a high-level summary of return-seeking versus capital preservation assets, and one aspect I want to highlight here is that. Jim mentioned some rebalancing that's occurred. There's going to be more rebalancing that will occur to bring the, the total fund closer to the new target. So I do want to address that for the board because there are going to be rebalancing done to get closer to the to the new target. So this is as of as of 331 and, and we are working with the staff to move closer to the new target. If we go on from here, please a couple slides ahead. Okay, one more to slide 10, please. Thank you. So this is showing the attribution for the quarter. So the total fund was down. It was a negative return, as you'd expect, given what we saw in, in the markets in general. And the total fund did slightly exceed the return of the target. This is a gross of free attribution that we do. And so what helped from a performance perspective is that you did see outperformance in fixed income and private credit and the overweight to private equity. As I had mentioned earlier, that, that did help drive relative performance and also the, the underweight to emerging markets. If you recall, emerging markets is one of the worst performing, performing parts of equity markets, so being underweight there did contribute. If we look a little bit longer term, if you go to the next slide, please, this is showing the one-year attribution. So, again, for for a plan like SERS, one year is is not a long period of time, but it's more meaningful than a quarter. And you can see the return was very strong for the one-year period because we had had a very strong capital markets returns coming into this year, and the performance was above the target. So, what drove that relative performance? It was the the performance of managers in a number of areas, including fixed income, private credit, and an international developed markets uh, equity. And then also the overweight to private equity, where private equity is by far the best performer on an absolute basis. You can see the total return was 50.6%. So being overweight there was a major contributor to the relative performance of the total fund. And then uh, on an asset class basis, the small underweights to emerging markets and equity and fixed income did also contribute to the return. But overall for the year, the return on target basis was strong and then the actual returns that were realized were even stronger. And that's driven by the both the, the effect of managers in, in different asset classes and then the asset allocation, which is really mainly the, the difference between the private equity uh, actual weight versus the target weight over the course of the year. And now the private equity weight has since been moved up in the new asset allocation. So I'm going to stop here in the interest of time. 
because I know there is a lot to cover on the agenda and we want to stay on schedule. If there's any questions or comments at this time, please uh, raise them now. Happy to address any questions or comments. Okay. I don't hear any. Chairman Becker, do you want us to cover the two DC reports or do you not in the interest of time? I want to see how you want us to handle that. Um, if you could do just a, a real high level, high quick level. review of each. Okay. Be appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Britt Murdoch will handle that. We'll just switch then to the one of those two. Thanks, Tom. Um, I will start with the 457 executive summary on page six. Uh, and it's, it, the it's in 5C in board docs. Or okay, sorry, thanks, my please. bad. Five B in board docs. They'll be labeled Callen four fifty seven executive summary. So, sorry, Brett, go ahead. No problem, Jim. Thanks. Um, so I'll start on uh, one more page uh, forward. Thank you. Just showing the asset allocation and the contributions for the four fifty seven plan. Uh, you can see consistent with past quarters. Um, the stable value fund and the U.S. large cap index continue to hold the majority of, al of assets, and you can see new contributions from participants on the right continue to also go towards those two funds. We turn ahead one page. Uh, we detail the asset distribution. As of March 31st, you can see total assets about $4.5 billion, um, some outflows from participants, and some unrealized negative investment returns. Um, slightly detracted from the asset values during the quarter. Um, I will skip ahead to uh, slide 10, uh, 11 of the top there, perfect. Uh, so we, here we show the BlackRock target date fund performance. Uh, you can see returns for the quarter given the equity markets uh, and the volatility that Tom discussed. Uh, we're negative on an absolute basis across the board, ranging from about negative 5.1 to about negative 5.5. Uh, longer term returns continue to be strong on an absolute and relative basis. Uh, importantly, these passive index funds continue to track their benchmarks adequately, uh, so there are no concerns in terms of the performance of the target date funds. We turn ahead two pages. Um, Slide 13, just detailing the individual options. Again, you can see um, the passive options here uh, continue to perform adequately and track their benchmarks uh, as we would expect. There was some fair value pricing uh, involved with the global non-US uh, equity index. You can see a little bit of differentiated differentiation uh, between the fund return and the benchmark. Uh, but we expect that to smooth out over time, and you can see it does over the three- and five-year time periods. Um, and lastly, I'll just highlight the stable value fund continues to perform very well. Are there any questions on the 457 plan? Okay, great. Um, I will quickly move to the 401A plan performance. I'll start on uh, page seven um, at the top there. You can see here detailing the asset allocation and contributions for the 401A plan. The target date funds make up over 80% of the asset allocation. Uh, and you can see most new contributions are also going to the target date funds, uh, which we view positively. Uh, and this new plan, you know, participants are, are gravitating towards the retirement funds, which are really diversified multi-asset um, options based on the age of the participants. So good to see uh, strong allocations to the target date funds. If we turn ahead one page, just de detailing the asset distribution. Um, this new plan assets continue to grow uh, up to about 79.8 million as of March 31st, uh, with about 8.6 million in new contributions. Uh, and some slight unrealized negative investment returns. Um, I will 
performance is on slide 10, reviewing the BlackRock target date funds. Uh, I will skip that because they are the same funds as the 457. Um, and then the individual options are also shown on slide 12. Um, and everything is performing adequately and in line with expectations. So I'll pause there. I know that was uh, quick, but uh, happy to answer any questions. That was a nice summary, Britt. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thanks, Chair Becker. Uh, we'll move on to the next item, uh, which is in board docs, item 5C, and that's the private equity quarterly performance update. Uh, that's a lagged uh, performance, as Tom just mentioned. Uh, these data are as of December 31st, 2021, um, and we'll continue to each quarter bring you uh, the latest data, which will be about two quarters behind, so that we have all the complete work. It's in Sarah's group uh, checking the values, ensuring everything is uh, in line uh, with the custodian and the performance provider. Uh, so that's going to that's going to be quarterly now, whereas in the past it's been uh, twice a year. So because we had some requests from some board members, and uh, Stepstone and NEPC have both stepped up to the challenge. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Mike Elio to uh, talk about this. Um, again, it's item 5C, if you can open up that presentation. Uh, I do want to highlight a couple of pages quickly before Mike starts. The first document is SIRS quarterly private equity board update live stream. That Katie's opening now. Thank you, Katie. And if you could go to the real page two, which is, uh, I, I go by the one in the presentation as opposed to the top there, thank you. Uh, just want to point out this portfolio uh, performance, uh, quite incredible. If you look, uh, the in, in the blue is the portfolio, and then the gray is the private market equivalent that takes cash flows in and out of the Russell 3000, which is uh, uh, a component of the benchmark which I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. But uh, you can see it's the blue bars are nicely ahead of the gray bars, meaning uh, this program has been generating better returns than had we just sat in a public market index. So that's the good news. Uh, we'd like to see the bars uh, continue the trend that we had over the last year, outstanding returns. Uh, there, there's been an emphasis in here for fewer larger funds, higher quality. You're going to hear a couple of more of those today. Uh, appreciate your support, and we're trying to pick the best of the best. And that is what's going to contribute to this chart as we come back to you a year from now, three, five years. So uh, again, uh, enjoy listening to the uh, outstanding opportunities that we're going to be bringing here today. The next page, Katie, please. Uh, page three of the presentation. Uh, I do want to point out over to the right side there, the PA surge number, while it is below uh, the gray bars, and we, we are working on overhauling the program that's been underway for the last five to seven years, about the window of time I, I came in. I'm on my sixth year here. Uh, we think things are turning, as we mentioned on the previous slide. But that second bar is the same index that we just talked about on page two, the Russell 3000. But it adds a full 3% on top of a already pretty tall order. US stocks uh, have delivered over long term a, a fairly attractive return. This, this program has been held to an additional three full percent. Uh, we're not in excess of that right now, but I'm very happy to see we're, we're closing in on it. So I just wanted to uh, extend thanks to the team for everything they're doing to get us into the best of the best. Um, and it's reflected here. So with that, um, we'll ask Mike Elio, unless there's any questions. I just assume you gave him the mic anyway, the expert. Uh, so Mike's going to go ahead, or, or Matt Roach, you're stepping in for Mike? JB, I'm going I'm to cover it, unfortunately, Mike. Okay, uh, very good. Matt Roach is uh, our our day-to-day uh, -day expert on this. He works with our team every week going through everything. So glad to see you, Matt. Take it away. Thanks. 
connects with you all. Um, if we could go back just just a couple slides, it'll be one on the bottom right corner. I think it's either two or three in PDF. Um, the summary here, and, and Tom teed me up well, and, and, and Jim did too, is that it's, it's been a fantastic year um, for, for Pennsylvania service and your, your beneficiaries. We were up uh, about 50% for the year in the private equity program, as, as Tom noted. Um, we have continued to see progress in the portfolio, particularly from a cash flow perspective, which is increasingly important here for your mature, mature portfolio. Uh, last year, we generated about $510 million of inflows. So that's, that's distributions net of contributions for the beneficiaries here. Um, the good news is despite market disruption so far in 2022, that trend has continued uh, year to date. So that's as of June 2nd, last, last evening, uh, right about $307 million of inflows, net inflows for the plan this year for the private equity program. Um, Jim covered slide two, which is the performance of the public market index. So we're gonna flip over to, to slide three here. Uh, and just double click real quickly on, on something that he was talking about. You know, like we at the direction of the committee, the broader board, and, and working with staff have, have worked over the last few years to um, reposition the investment strategy focused on a trend prevalent in the industry, which is fewer, larger, focus on higher quality managers, move away from venture capital, so into equity, um, and, 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 and have a de emphasis on emerging markets. And so I think what you've seen here is the results in the one, three, five, and 10 year periods for the core buyout, the core growth equity, and the core special situations portfolios. Um, all are doing really well. We've got the Keystone Legacy portfolio managed by Fairview. The views are obviously lacking benchmarks. That portfolio was mature. Would not expect that to change, frankly, in the long term. Uh, but it's been very cash generative for you guys and it will continue to be so. Um, there's, a, there's a slide a few forward that I, that I wish we'd pulled up that I'm gonna, I'm gonna just cover now and steal thunder from, uh, which is slide seven. Uh, which compares this same portfolio uh, to the public market equivalents. What you'll see is the core portfolio is, is doing really well on a one, three, five, ten year basis, particularly on a one, three, and five year basis. That's a lot of those changes. Uh, Jim noted the high benchmark of Russell three plus three in each of those one, three, and five year benchmark periods. We've outperformed on a one, on a, a, a Russell three plus three, uh, notably sort of five to 600 points ahead on the longer periods. The 10 years is just below. Um, the since inception, again, is outperforming Russell 3 plus 3 for the core portfolio, which we're very happy with, and we, we think reflects uh, well the changes that, that we have made, uh, again, at the direction of this committee board and working with staff uh, in the portfolio here. And as Jim said, um, continued with the folks that, that we plan to talk to today with both Sen and Um Yeah, I think the the, the last thing I'll say to go back to slide five uh, is just, just looking against private markets benchmarks here. We've done well. Um, you know, I think the, the reality is on a, on a median basis in the last decade with just a couple of exceptions, we're, we're uh, above the median. And so I feel very good about that. It's a reflection on continuing to pay high quality managers. And I think we are very focused um, talked about this with, with folks before just on, on consistent pacing and making sure that uh, in, even in periods of turmoil that we take the view of long-term asset class here. Um, we have talked about this, that we, that we sort of reflected on the uh, potential downturn that may come in 2022, which it has from a dominated perspective, and, and for that reason suggest, suggested a pacing that was uh, a $1.1 billion private credit program going forward. Um, that program, just to remind, or that pacing level, just to remind folks, actually, anticipated with a 20% shock to returns this year, uh, gets us pretty close to the 16% target return 10 years from now. And so uh, that was purposeful. We will continue to reflect on that and reflect on that basis with you all uh, while pursuing the best opportunities available at the time and, and maintaining consistent pacing. If I can flip to private credit just for a second, and I, and I know we're, we're, we're trying to be efficient here, um, which is the other document in board docs uh, in, in our program tab. A lot of good news in the private credit portfolio as well. I know that we're folding that into the, the broader special sits program within private equity. Um, the inception to date terms on that private credit program are 19%, uh, which is on, on slide one there. Obviously very happy with that. As that program has grown, it has been a net outflow program. Last year we had net outflows of $244 million. 
uh, still combined with private equity. And so as this sort of illiquid alls program, we were net inflows of 265. Um, year to date on private credit, net outflows 30, net inflows combined with PE, $270 million year to date. So that's as of last evening. Um, obviously very pleased with the performance of the program here, flipping one, one slide forward. Uh, relative to uh, uh, the, the lever loan index and high yield, we've done very well, 19% very good return. We will continue to preserve the strongest of these relationships going forward within the program here. And very excited about um, the sort of platform we built. Maybe I'll pause there. I know we were scheduled for five minutes. We have five slides. Uh, try to hit the highlights and go quickly. Um, happy to answer any questions that folks have as well. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, and, and the materials and board docs are there for your, uh, uh, there's deeper reviews and so forth in there for your convenience. So, Matt, thanks for covering that. And just a reminder, we did combine the private credit and private equity. Uh, so going forward, that'll be a combined report. We'll still maintain these, uh, most of these opportunities in the private credit space uh, as they do have the, uh, they do justify the returns are significant, and we'll have them in our special situations subcomponent of the private equity asset class. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Uh, if we could move on to the next item, uh, this would be 5D, and David, in real estate, uh, quarterly performance report. Uh, Matt Ritter is going to talk to us uh, about that. Again, these are very high level. Uh, the more detailed reports are available in board docs for all the private markets, as always. The difference here is we're bringing the consultants in so you get to see them a little bit more often uh, per year in line with our funds and recommendation. Um, and, and also, it, it's good to hear from these experts that are out there and tell, so they can tell you what they're seeing uh, real time. That's excellent. Before Matt starts, though, if, if you could, Katie, open up that presentation. Um, and that's labeled, yes, that's the live stream presentation, real estate quarterly performance report. And go to page two, please. You'll see the performance recap. Uh, again, this is a asset class in transition that we've been working on over the last few years. Uh, we've made some additional tweaks, as you know, at the last meeting to the asset allocation to further enhance the returns going forward. Uh, I've had many meetings with board members concerned about the lower returns that we've been experiencing. We worked with Matt Ritter and the team at NEPC. What can we do about this to get real estate to contribute more to that return that we're trying to, currently 7%, we'll see what happens uh, here at the next Sarah's meeting, but currently trying to get to that 7%. How can we get this optimized better? So that has been uh, analyzed, vetted, discussed, and implemented last meeting. So we're hoping to see this trend that we're seeing here pointing out the one and three year returns in particular here in double digits. That's what we're trying to get the real estate to be instead of the single digit world that it lived in in the past. So with that, I'll ask Matt to uh, take it away and enlighten you. Everything real estate in this coming out of the pandemic and everything else, uh, feel free to ask Matt questions. Go ahead, Matt, thanks. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, so starting on this page here, page two, uh, just a quick performance summary. Jim hit a lot of the highlights, uh, but maybe just to reiterate, you know, looking at some of those trailing time period returns, um, as Jim mentioned, we've been, you know, since NEPC was hired roughly five years ago, there's been a lot of changes we've made to the portfolio. I, you know, I would contend, I think, a, a lot of improvements that we've made to try to, you know, bring up that total return, as Jim was talking about. The most recent change being what we discussed, um, what was discussed at the last investment committee meeting, which I'll come back to in a, in a couple of slides. That's the that's the uh, update to the, the target substrategy allocations. But maybe just to reflect on performance here uh, a little bit, um, you know, the SERS real estate portfolio, like the rest of the real estate market, faced some challenges and uncertainty in 2020, driven by the onset of the pandemic. However, as you can see, 2021 was was a very strong year for real estate assets uh, with the Odyssey, which is the index of open-ended core real estate funds, 
posting its highest um, calendar year return at, at over uh, at about 21% net of fees. So very strong year for real estate um, and very strong year for the SERS real estate portfolio as well, generating a 19.6% net return. So clearly very happy with that. Um, and then, you know, that, that has also helped, uh, as Jim alluded to, looking at the trailing three-year number now at 11.3%. Um, so, you know, clearly I think moving in the right direction and, and strong returns, you know, contributing to the portfolio, which we're very pleased with. Um, just speaking of the portfolio itself, you know, NEPC continues to believe that the portfolio is healthy in a good position today. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean there's not still work to do. Um, we, we talked about the, the changes to the portfolio construction. Um, and then, of course, there's the pacing plan, which calls for uh, $150 million of new commitments this year. Um, and then, of course, NEPC and SERS Investment Office will continue to monitor the existing investments as well. So turning ahead to page three, uh, I'll just hit this one quickly. Uh, SERS has a very mature and highly diversified real estate portfolio. As you can see on these charts on the left-hand side, uh, diversified by geography across regions, uh, both in the U.S. and then about 17% invested internationally, as well as by property type, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, turning ahead to page four, uh, we display some of the historical cash flows for the portfolio. Um, and what this chart tries to show is just is the real estate overall a net contributor, you know, positive cash flow generator or drawing cash out of the service portfolio. Um, so the green bars being distributions back to service from real estate. Red bars being contributions or capital paid into real estate. Um, at, you know, since since there's a large allocation of closed end funds, there's always going to be new capital going in. But as you can see with the the dotted black line here, the SERS portfolio has uh, the real estate portfolio has generally been a net cash flow generator for SERS, which is great. Um, you know, in 2020, you see a smaller green line and, and the net cash flow dipped negative. Um, that was not unique to SERS. That was something we saw across our client base, um, you know, really driven by uncertain, uncertainty and market disruptions from COVID. Probably no, no surprise to anyone. You know, asset sales slowed down and, and some managers decided to keep some capital, you know, back on the balance sheet just in case, uh, just given the uncertainty. But in 2021, we saw a bit of a return to normal with the portfolio again generating positive cash flow for SERS. Um, turning to page five, um, this summarizes those changes to the portfolio construction that, that Jim and I both mentioned earlier. Um, just as a slight refresher, um, the core and core plus allocation, the target allocation will decrease from 35 to 25, REITs from 10 to 5 percent, um, and then value at an opportunistic or non-core real estate. Those targets will increase from 55 to 70 percent of the portfolio. Um, and we did this, you know, really believing that these changes should, you know, they'll increase the total expected return for the real estate portfolio um, while still maintaining strategic allocations to the core, core plus and REIT strategies, which we think should play a long term role in the portfolio. They just don't need to be quite as large as they as they have been historically. And so we'll continue to work with SERS Investment Office to implement this plan over time. It's going to take, you know, quite quite some time given the illiquidity of some of these investments. Um, but we'll implement this plan, and then also, of course, you know, continue to source uh, new investment opportunities, underwrite those opportunities for the SERS portfolio. Uh, one one of which you'll hear about later on the agenda. Um, and then lastly, just to, to wrap up page six, we have just some very high level update on the market environment. Um, you know, I'll maybe just say in general first, we, we do think there are attractive opportunities for investment in the real estate market today. Um, however, just as a broad general comment, um, you know, we believe that regardless of the market environment, it's important to not try and time the market. And that's something you'll hear from us, whether we think it's a you know super attractive time to invest or maybe, you know, maybe a little bit less attractive. Um, private real estate funds are long term in nature. They've got long investment periods, even longer holding periods. And it's important to just maintain that consistent pacing and follow your pacing plan and not try to time the market. 
Um, that said, just to speak to some broad themes in, re in the real estate market today, you know, summarizing, you know, all the, the countless meetings we have uh, with, with managers and with clients, um, the real estate market today has been, the returns have been driven largely by industrial and residential sectors. Um, both of these sectors have seen historically low occupancy rates and continued demand growth. Um, which, you know, those two things combined, not a lot of free space and a lot of, a lot of increase in demand, that leads to high rent growth. So very strong returns for those sectors. Also, just high level capital markets for real estate, um, both debt and equity financing remain healthy and available. Um, that said, you know, one, one of the things that maybe some investors are concerned about, um, which I think could be a potential headwind, is just the rise in interest rates. Um, you know, probably not a surprise to, to many of you, uh, interest rates going up, you know, that means debt financing does get more expensive for, for real estate investors. It also could put some upward pressure on cap rates. But again, as I began this slide, we do still think there are attractive opportunities. Just want to give a little bit of a flavor of you know what we're seeing in the market today. Um, and with that, I'll I'll, I'll stop there. Um, try to keep this relatively brief. Um, thank you all for your time. Great to great to see many familiar faces, and I'll I'll see if there's any questions. Okay, Matt. Thank you very much. Nice summary. Um, again, interest of time here, we're going to keep moving along. Um, and now we're going to transition from uh, uh, performance reporting and background information and move into uh, some new investment opportunities. If I could direct you to 5E as in Edward and Board Docs, private equity opportunity with Sentinel Capital Partners. And if you could please open up the first slide for those of you on Board Docs. Uh, CIO introduction slides, um, and I'll. Katie, thank you. And K Katie, if we can go to page three on the bottom right of the slide, that will uh, start out our conversation as always, and follow up where Matt Ritter just left off. The importance of pacing. Uh, that's one of the diversification levers that we can pull in private markets, ensuring that we're not timing the markets in a good year, as Matt said, or. or a good year, as he said, or a bad year. Uh, we try to just invest evenly across uh, all those years. We also try to diversify the strategy from a geographic perspective, from uh, a subsector perspective. We don't want to go 100% into any one segment of the market. So these diversification levers are available. We're mindful of them. We're working with the consultants on that. Uh, the pacing, as you recall from last meeting, we reduced uh, to uh, address the higher exposure that we currently have, partly from what Tom Shingler had uh, uh, labeled the denominator effect, where the general markets have declined in value while private equity uh, being lagged like it is, doesn't experience the same volatility, and it would appear that it's higher in its exposure than it, than, than it truly is when the numbers catch up uh, about six months later. But nevertheless, we do want to look at this. We trimmed back the pacing at the last meeting, and looking out 10 years to the far right there, you can see a circle around the expected exposure. This takes into account all the contributions and distributions that will occur in private markets, plus new pacing uh, agreed upon during each year through these board meetings. Putting all that into a mixer, what comes out on the backside 10 years from now, we, we look to be below our 16% target. It looks like we'd come in at 12.9. Not the fear, though. Uh, we're being conservative. Stepstone has uh, been working with us consistently on this. It's, it's best to err on the, on the caution side, so that's why we trim back the pacing. Uh, and then we're going to continue to update this pacing every year at the committee meeting. So we'll be coming back to you later this year, in fact, with an update on that. So that's just an important thing on pacing that's going to apply to the next two presentations. So thank you for listening to that. Katie, if you could please advance to slide four. This is our pacing so far this year. Again, at the top, we have a $1.1 billion target down from $1.3 billion originally. This is, again, 
taking into account combining private equity and private credit. Uh, and what we have approved so far this year previously, plus what we have uh, in front of you today, assuming those new opportunities today are approved, will be uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 810 of that, 810 million of that 1.1 billion. So we'll still uh, have several hundred million to go for the remaining uh, committee meetings this year. Just want to point that out. Uh, this is important for the vintage year diversification. We want to hit that 1.1. We don't want to go over it, but we do want to hit it. Uh, so we'll continue to source the opportunities, look for the best of the best, and come at you. Speaking of that, uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please, Katie. Page five. Uh, Sentinel Capital Partners. The blue bars on these slides uh, indicate funds that we have been in previously. Uh, as you look at those returns over time, sadly, we're not in more of these funds. We were in uh, Sentinel uh, 5, um, and they uh, handed back 22% uh, return for us, and that ranks them in the second quartile in, in the buyout universe. This is a diversified manager, which is important. As I said, we diversify with sectors. We don't want to go into all energy or all technology or all anything. This is a very diversified manager. They, they focus on uh, some, some consumer sectors, whether it be restaurants and uh, health care services. It's a very important thing that happens in our society. Uh, these, this firm has a specialty. Perhaps when you listen to David LaBelle in a moment, he'll, he'll give examples such as uh, a restaurant, they have the, a cook, they have uh, delivery, uh, they have the customer at the other end, but how do you make it all happen so that the customer gets the food still hot? They come in and help optimize and, and make operations become more efficient. So that's their specialty, and David will talk about that. So I don't want to steal his thunder. Uh, if you could advance to the next page, Katie. Uh, I'm happy to report that David and his company are uh, fully in agreement with uh, all of our transparency initiatives. And you can see there they've checked off yes on every one of them. And they are, uh, they've embarked on a uh, uh, diversity program as well, which David's going to talk about. And he's also brought in an investment professional. Uh, and, and she's going to be participating in this meeting as well. So sit back and enjoy. This is one of the best managers out there in this space and would be a big addition to our, a great addition to our portfolio. Uh, before David speaks, so we're going to ask uh, Matt Roach to come on and just talk about that portfolio fit and how this complements our portfolio. So Matt, if you could please update the staff and then we'll hand it over to David. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to break out my thesaurus between this and the Veritas presentation because I'm, I'm a little bit sound like a broken record. Um, this is one of our highest conviction managers in the middle market. That should be obvious based on the returns that they've generated today, based on the peer comparison that you can see in our long memo. Uh, it fits well in the service portfolio. We've, we've talked to you folks about um, some growth your man managers, some tech managers. Uh, that's not the bread and butter of what Sentinel does, what they do that David will talk about um, from a sector exposure is, is complementary to what you have in your portfolio and also from a way that they approach the market perspective, uh, which, which has been principally focused on what I'll call relative value investing. Um, and so we think this has a good niche in the portfolio. It is, it is one of our highest conviction names in the market. Um, we're pleased to, to present this to you folks um, for consideration, given that you have an existing relationship and, and consider renewing that relationship with Sentinel. Jim, back to you or over to David. Um, Dr. Man, whatever works best. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And David, uh, please take it away. Uh, that, that document will be in board docs, uh, the same 5E. E, uh, and this will be the live stream presentation, and Katie will be showing that on the live stream screen. So, uh, David, if you could introduce your team and uh, give a little background, because uh, some of the board members haven't seen Sentinel in a couple of years. Fun Five was our last one, so please introduce the team and uh, take it away. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jim, and good morning. It is such a pleasure for us to hear all the nice things that have been said about us. Um, we'd like to come and visit with you a little bit more often. 
uh, to hear that. I'm David Lobel, as you heard, the founder and managing partner of Sentinel, and joining me are my co-founder, John McCormick, and Dr. Alice Mann, our lead partner who spearheads human capital. And we thank you very, very much for considering Sentinel. So let's dive in and go straight to number slide number two. We are very proud of our accomplishments over the past 26 years. Our track record is excellent, and for the 58 realizations that we've generated, we have achieved 3.1 times cost and a 30% gross IRR. Our successes have greatly outnumbered our setbacks, which fortunately have been few. We've resolved never to sugarcoat our misses because we've always felt an obligation to our LPs to be candid and transparent. And we've also invested the time and emotional energy to learn from our mistakes and not repeat them. Our accomplishments result from a huge team effort. Let's go to slide three and I'll give you a snapshot of our organization. Our organization has all the key functional capabilities in place and it's set out on this slide. Importantly, our core partner team has had zero turnover since inception. Our private equity platform is stable and has a strong culture that will enable Sentinel to endure. Few private equity firms have accomplished such milestones and we are very proud to be one of them. We spread the GP economics really deep in our organization. In fact, several of our administrative assistants share in the GP economics. For now, this is all I will say about our team in the interest of time, but we would certainly welcome any questions that you might have. Turning it over now to my partner, Alice, and Dr. Alice Mann. Thank you, David. <clears throat> During the past, uh, can we turn to the next slide, please? Thank you. <clears throat> During the past two decades, Sentinel has placed a high priority on ESG principles. We have in place a comprehensive ESG policy that's overseen by a partner-led <clears throat> ESG committee that covers everything that we touch and do. As for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Sentinel has a long history of building an inclusive and transparent culture. We direct our search partners to source at least 25% qualified diverse candidates on every search, and on our associate searches, that's closer to 50%. In fact, our 2023 class of associates is going to be 50% diverse. Inside Sentinel, we promote DE&I through training programs, talent development, and partnering with external affinity groups. We would welcome any questions on these important topics. Uh, Treasurer Garrity has a question. I do, sorry, I couldn't find the hand button. Um, I guess my question is, your diversity efforts must be fairly new because it appears you don't have a single African-American or Hispanic in your investment office operations and all the junior level associates, I think uh, only two out of 11 are females. So are these, is this a new focus for you? The the effort around uh, inclusive culture is, is longstanding. We have the, you know, the, the foundation of, of a culture where Everybody has a vote um, on the investment committee decision making and people do exercise that. So the building blocks are there. As far as the journey around hiring uh, diverse members in the onto the investment team and, and also across the firm, we, we are on that journey. We have uh, four women on the investment team. Um, we're very committed um, to a diverse uh, investment team and firm. We, um, a lot of it is around sourcing uh, candidates, and there's a lot of competition for diverse candidates. We're going up against uh, uh, mega funds and other private equity firms that are also competing for diverse talent, um, but we are very committed to it, and we work uh, on um, setting goals with all of our recruiting partners uh, to source candidates, and, you know, when we do, when we are, um, you know, across our investment team, we're really working on talent development, 
management and so that people get the mentoring that they need when they do join us and they stay with us. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to add into that uh, answer there, Treasurer. Uh, we did contact, we had a, a request from a board member uh, designee on clarification for the DDQs for the uh, manager, and they went uh, into the uh, midnight hours. They're getting back a nice response to us, and it's been distributed to you all in board docs. And uh, th they have uh, adopted a new policy. Um, uh, for for this specific purpose of uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, so that was sent over and distributed to board doc. So I'll point you to that. It's there for your convenience. It is a new, uh, relatively new initi initiative that the firm, as as everybody's doing, all all the firms, including ourselves, we're all trying very hard to hire diverse candidates. What happens though, as a result of that, uh, there's only so many to go around and. Uh, the, the highest bidder often ends up uh, taking the prize. Uh, so we have to continue to work on that, and they're doing the same thing. Um, it's it's difficult, and this, as Joe Torta had said earlier in the meeting, this is a very tight labor market, and uh, diversity is, e is even tighter within that. So, But they do have an initiative underway. They sent us the policy over, and we're, we're very happy that they responded as quickly as they did on that. And I, encourage you to please take a look at that in the board docs. Jim, Jim, I did read it, hence my questions. Um, I, I absolutely did read it. I know, um, Thank you. I know Treasury, we have 56% diverse work workforce, so I guess it's the first time I'm hearing that people can't find diverse candidates, but thank you. So well, I, could speak, I could speak to that quickly, which is CPI is our, our recruiting partner for associates, and they, they place 9% um, um, uh, ethnic and racial minorities and 30% women um, in across private equity. So that sort of gives you a sense of the pool. Mr. Rocco had his, has his hand up and then uh, Senator DeSanto, please. Th th thank you very much. I, I don't doubt uh, these financial numbers uh, and the comments by our consultants and by Jim. Um, but I do have a question for Dr. Mann, um, which is the original answers to our diversity questions, which are standard for all of our potential partners. Um, I read those answers, um, and that's why I asked additional questions, and that's why we provided all new answers last night. So Dr. Mann, I just want to know, were you involved in writing the first set of answers? That unfortunately, I would, I would state my opinion that the answers that Sentinel provided us were amateurish, um, and I would have a hard time believing that you were actually involved in preparing me. So, do you have any role in writing or reviewing uh, Sentinel's uh, answers to us about diversity? I certainly was involved in the the the, the set of uh, answers that were provided last night. Um, I started in uh, at the end of January, and so I was less involved in all of the preparations um, up, un up until then. Can I just uh, say a word on this? We made a decision going back three years ago that we wanted to bring in a real high-powered professional to help us on this journey. And that led to the hiring of Dr. Mann. Uh, we had hoped to bring in the person, Dr. Mann, much earlier, but uh, COVID had interrupted us because when COVID hit in uh, late March of 2020, for the next eight, nine months, we basically put that search on hold because we couldn't meet with anybody in person because of the COVID situation. But um, we were successful in the search and uh, it, it delayed us on the timetable we actually wanted but beginning in the first quarter of this year we have picked up a lot of steam and now we have a real professional helping us in this endeavor and it, my apologies to you i did not review it either i had some of our uh, legal and administrative staff who drafted those questions uh, but i'm i'm very pleased that i got it in time for this board meeting 
so that we now you're now getting the the view from the top from the partners from Dr. Mann, myself, John McCormick, and other of the partners. Senator DeSanto. Senator DeSanto. Yes, thank you. I just um, want to comment with my ongoing objection to this ESG and DEI uh, line of discussion with our potential investors. I don't believe it's our role to tell companies how to run their business. Uh, the legislature and governor has not given us direction on this stuff. Um, as they, we discussed in the board retreat, when there were other disinvestment um, strategies dictated to us and we disinvested ourselves of things, uh, this stuff is not definable. It's not measurement measurable. Uh, in contrast to the transparency checklist, which is very definable and measurable, and our fiduciary duty is to our plan holders to get the best return that we can for them, and that's what we should be focusing on. Assuming our investment partners are not doing anything illegal, I don't believe we should be injecting ourselves into their business operations and how they provide a very good return for us. Thank you. Thank you for that, Senator DeSanto. And uh, we'll turn it back. Uh, David, if you could uh, wrap up your, your uh, you have some additional slides about the business. Thank you for your contribution, Dr. Mann, and clarifying that. But we do want to give you an opportunity to talk about your other slides with your uh, excellent results. So if you could do that uh, in fairly short order, then we can we can move on here. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is John McCormick. I'll uh, take the next slide, which is slide five, uh, which is our track record since inception. Um, so we've delivered uh, strong and consistent returns over a very long period of time uh, through investment environments that ranged from benign to brutal. Um, and I would also note that funds uh, two through six all have at least one key metric that places the fund in the top quartile. Thanks, John. I'm going to try to speed through because we do have some important material to discuss. On slide six, please. This one gets to the essence of how we've achieved consistent and premium returns and how we differentiate ourselves. We believe that the most reliable predictor of investment returns is the entry multiple paid. Since inception, we have consistently been able to buy businesses at one to three turns of EBITDA below the industry average. How do we do it? In a single word, complexity. And here's how it works. When a company comes to market for sale, looking like a brand new Mercedes, ready to hit the road at high speed, with the driver not having to worry about the car breaking down, such a business will typically fetch a very full multiple. Today, in the mid-teens or even higher. Buyers take comfort in these types of businesses, which typically attract a lot of interest. But when a company comes to market looking like a used car, with some dings and dents, it's roadworthy, but needs to be driven gently. Many prospective buyers will retreat because they don't have the tools to deal with the dings and the dents. The pool of bidders then shrinks, the entry multiple contracts, and it's this type of situation that Sentinel focuses on. What we then do is put the company in the garage for a while. We systematically reduce or eliminate the dings and the dents. And when done, and this will typically take us six months, maybe 12 months, we'll take the company out of the shop and put our foot on the gas. And down the road, when it comes time to exit, our aim is that the next buyer does sees a much more attractive picture than we saw, and that gives us the ability to recapture that entry multiple discount on the way out and generate a premium return, as we've consistently done. This strategy has produced excellent results for us, even in the most challenging of environments. Next slide, please. 
In building Sentinel, one of our central goals was to create a well-defined culture and set an example from the top. This vision is now reality and the key elements are here on the slide. At the core of our culture is a commitment to transparency, teamwork and humility. We also invest heavily in our young professionals and use the apprentice method. We take full ownership for our mistakes, yet when it comes to our successes, we spend little time patting ourselves on the back. Instead, we give the credit where it is due to the executives who run our companies. This is the character of our firm and we're very proud to have built a lasting and powerful culture that will continue well beyond the current generation of partners. To slide eight, please. This slide highlights our investment strategy and approach. And I'm gonna let John McCormick speak to this. Okay, um, so yeah, this is our investment strategy and approach. Uh, there are three pillars. Uh, we have adhered to this strategy since we opened our doors uh, 26 years ago, or more than 26 years ago. And here are the key elements. We focus on lower mid-market businesses, generally with EBITDA below $50 million. We target niche market leaders in four sectors, business services, consumer, healthcare services, and industrials. We drive enterprise value by growing sales, EBITDA, and free cash flow and most importantly, paying down debt. Um, we have a dedicated uh, a team, a four-person team in business development that ensures that we see all of the investment opportunities out there that match our strategy. And as if you he you've heard, we um, have a value orientation with a differentiated approach to tackling complexity. We pursue buy and build platforms in fragmented industries where we can secure add-on acquisitions at highly accretive multiples. And we've successfully done hundreds of these. And we also set ourselves apart by taking the time to connect with our management partners um, and letting the chemistry develop and learning what matters most to them so we can help them achieve their goals. And when we do this, sellers and management teams come to trust us. And because of these soft factors, we're sometimes not the highest bidder in the deals that we win. Thanks, John. Now to slide nine. I'll briefly mention the significant forensic accounting capability we have built, which we consider a huge differentiating factor. We have a dedicated 14-person team of forensic experts who work on everything we do from pre-acquisition all the way to the ultimate exit. Once we own a company, every month, our forensic team independently recreates each company's monthly reporting package and compares this to what the company sends us. Any material difference between the two sends up a flag. Most of our peers do this just once at the front of a transaction. We do this every single month, which positions us to act proactively and quickly. We know of no other US private equity firm that has such an in-house forensic accounting capability. On slide 10, please. This one will be our last slide and it summarizes our junior capital strategy, which is a natural extension of our equity business and powerfully leverages Sentinel sourcing diligence and value creation capabilities. We bring to junior capital investing a principal ownership perspective. We believe that our hands-on approach to junior capital investing is a key ingredient to our ability to generate premium returns for this investment category, as we also do in the private equity category. Our junior, junior capital fund is performing beautifully. It's generating an equity-like return of 23% gross IRR. And importantly, we have had zero impairments. This concludes our formal remarks. 
And I'd like to leave you with just one parting thought. If you were to speak to our LPs, besides hearing about our strong track record and stable organization, they would tell you that we have always placed their interests ahead of our own. And they will also tell you that we have best in class reporting. Thank you all very, very much for your time and consideration. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, David. And uh, Mr. Ockley, you have your hand up. Um, thank you. Whenever there's appropriate time for additional questions, I'm happy if that's the time, Jim. Whenever we'll, we'll, I'm just trying to follow uh, uh, what your guidelines. Yes, this is that time. Uh, perfect, perfect timing, Dan. Go. Take it away. Oh. Oh. Well, uh, um, it, it, it. so, 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 Doctor Mann, um, you, you've 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 started in January. You, you've now been here several months. Um, mm -hmm. Are you able to tell us in the track record of the twenty years or more? Uh, it, 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 it's just it's very hard to. Um, it's it's very hard to reason um, this you know this the, your discussion of this the the absolute numbers listed here and and I mean do you, do, you, do, do Jim I think this is actually I'm, I'm I apologize I'm not trying to ask a question I'd like to make a comment or a discussion so whenever if this is the appropriate time for discussion that's fine yes it is. Okay, so so, so um, one of our other board members said that that we shouldn't care about um, diversity and that it's not in the legislative intent for our body. Uh, I would say this is not just about diversity. This is about trust. We're about to entrust this organization um, with uh, more than a hundred million dollars of our money. This presentation was given multiple examples in this presentation of their diligence, of their expertise in, in getting precise facts, in their ability to double check everything. And, and we, received, we received a questionnaire with material facts incorrectly put. Okay, they, they told us facts that did not exist. And until we pointed them out to them last night, they didn't admit it. And that's a very serious thing. And it's not just about diversity, it's about trust. And the fact that their person in charge of diversity was working in January, and we either got this questionnaire in April or May, and I'm happy to hear from, from Jim or, or the other staff when we got this, um, with literally, am, I, I hate to say amateurish, but 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 um, you know we'd be happy to read it or whatever. Um, I also think that this is very high carried interest, you know, of of twenty five percent. Now there, you know, there's a, a benchmark of of, of nine percent return, um, but 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 uh, we have a fiduciary responsibility, and the example was brought of a car, and if uh, uh, you know how we look at cars. If, if I was buying a car from someone and I found out that there were significant um, uh, misfacts or material uh, representations that were not correct, um, I would not be buying a car from that person. So I am, I am, um, um, I believe that there is, I, I have significant concerns and it goes way beyond diversity and, um, and if anyone would want to make the argument of diversity, uh, that's fine. But 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 we're here and with entrusted with taxpayers' money and and the the, the money of our our the annuitants. And um, I don't believe the the material facts that were misstated to us. Um, I, I, I believe that's material. I believe that's significant. And, and I believe that it doesn't leave me any question. Uh, or, or, or Representative Frankel, who, who I work for, any question on how, how we're going to vote on this? Let me speak to that. Um, so I understand your concerns, and these are all really important questions, and it's a significant uh, investment. What I can tell you is that I, Sentinel is on a journey um, with ESG, you know, longer, and with DE&I more recently. 
Um, what I can tell you, though, is that what they have focused on for their entire history is a very inclusive culture. And so I know people in, in many, many private equity firms, so I do know what the different cultures are like. And a lot of firms are focusing on hiring diverse people into their firm, but not on the culture that allows everybody to have a voice and to feel a part of a team and to contribute at their highest level. And what I can tell you is that walking into Sentinel four months later, I have, have it's been a very seamless transition to come into a, an environment that actually takes a lot longer to develop than hiring. The hiring part is a challenge, but the, the culture that allows everybody to have a voice and to have very deep discussions and dialogue um, you know, that's drama free, but that's really based on facts, the high integrity and humility um, is, is very distinct. And, and those are things that are, take a long time to build. So I'm confident that with a commitment around hiring and building out a diverse team, we are at the beginning of that journey and we can, we can do, definitely do better, but we are committed to it. Thanks for that, Dr. Main. Mr. DeSanto, Senator DeSanto. Yes. I Thank you. I just want to clarify uh, Dan's observation. You know, our role as board members is to preserve and grow assets. It's not to micromanage companies' diversity initiatives. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. His example of a car, you know, are we going to start looking at Ford Motor Company and all this type of stuff? These issues are important and they're internal to the company and their success depends on it. It's not our job as board members to be evaluating a financial investment based on their internal initiatives. That's all I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you for that, Senator. Um, Chair Becker he has his hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, I just um, wanted to make a comment here. We have been invested with Sentinel uh, since, uh, well, we're in, in um, Fund 5, so I, since around 2014, I would I would say. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and we've had uh, very good results. I guess a, a question I would have for both Stepstone and our staff, have we had any issues any questions about there was the, the, the term trust was thrown out here. Have we had we've been with them for six or seven years? Have we had any issues or concerns over that period of time? Uh, from an internal perspective, uh, that that would be no. We, uh, we work with Stepstone regularly on sourcing opportunities, and the focus on this particular opportunity was the outstanding returns, not. Uh, in the same space as most of our other outstanding performers. It's a rare opportunity. It's a diversification opportunity. Uh, so we had, no, we haven't had any trust issues whatsoever. Uh, the only thing we, we wish we did differently was continue to invest in these funds as you look at fund, uh, the, the returns across the whole the lineup. Uh, Matt Roach, do you want to opine on that at all from your perspective on the, uh, on the trust issue that Chair Becker's bringing forward, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, and um, <laughs> I hope this sounds sincere um, because David gave a preview to it. Uh, the furthest thing from trust issues is what I would say in, in, in the sentiment that he gave about uh, oversharing um, in the, the learnings that they have through this and prior fundraisers as well as other conversations we have from my that are really sincere. Um, I think it, it's important to have this conversation. I suspect that David and John and Dr. Mann will take this conversation will resonate and they will continue along their journey. If you hear that you're talking about um, the furthest, the furthest thing from trust issues, I think organizations have spent uh, hours on, on the very detail requests have received an unparalleled level of, of sort of transparency in the way that we've dealt with Sentinel. Um, and I think what you, you see from folks here is, is is a mission to be a good partner for their limited partners um, and also to push through exemplary returns for their limited partners, um, which they've achieved through a remarkable level of consistency, both, both through cycles, um, through you know, increases in fund sizes, um, and a remarkable level of consistency across the team. I think David and John covered a slide that probably undersold this. Um, and, and, and this is this, this will route back to the diversity question, which is that 
uh, the average tenure of the partners over 20 years, with the exception of those two, all of them started at junior professionals at Stepstone. This is a 20-year journey for the firm, um, and for us, we're very focused on making sure that the aperture is open wide enough, that new classes that we can are diverse, that it's focused for the firm, um, and then building up the right investment professionals for the future, and, and, and I think Dr. Mann covered that well. Um, but to, to the root of the original question that Chair Becker asked, no, the furthest thing from uh, trust or openness issues with them. I, I think it's been a, a very strong and open and candid relationship. Jim, can I just say a word about our relationship with uh, StepStone? Um, Please. John and I, John and I um, worked under the City Group Smith Barney umbrella, and a major piece of the StepStone, Stepstone team came from Citigroup. That was the genesis of our relationship with Stepstone because we had a pre-existing relationship going back with City. We have been working with the Stepstone team or members of the Stepstone team going back to fund number three, which was in 2004. So this relationship with Stepstone, we have a relationship that's now headed into its, its second decade, almost two decades something like 17 years. And we've never, ever had an integrity issue, a trust issue, uh, any kind of tension or difficulty when it comes to the subject of integrity or character. And, you know, you can talk to Matt or any of his partners who've known us for even longer on that subject. Thank you for that, David. Dan, 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 oh, go ahead. Dan, do you have your hand up again, or is that uh, residual? So, so, so this is this is a question for for Stepstone and our uh, our investment consultants, which is uh, this fund proposes a twenty five percent carried interest, and, and maybe Jim might know this also. In terms of our prior prior investment in two thousand fourteen, or, or any of the other investments prior to, did have have had, have any, have our investments in the past? with them have had such a high rate of carried interest uh, as, as this, or is this higher rate new, uh, a, a newer a, a, a newer situation? Matt, you want to take that, or David's shaking his head? <laughs> I, I can tell you, this is the same. We haven't changed anything since Fund 5 since your last investment. This is exactly the same. Yeah, we will point out they have a, a slightly higher preferred return than we normally see an 8% preferred return. And this this firm uh, uh, assures us a 9% before they even smell carry. Before they smell. Keep in mind, if they're getting 25% of the profit as a partnership, we get 75%. That's after all our capital's returned to us, all the fees that were uh, contributed uh, to operate. Uh, that all gets returned to us plus nine percent before that uh, turns on, and we start getting our seventy-five percent. Uh, Mr. Jordan, thank you, Jim. Just following up on the uh, uh, carried interest conversation here, I noticed in the footnotes that the twenty-five percent is comprised of, I guess, what I'll paraphrase as a twenty uh, percent normal sort of carried and then 5% is through a European waterfall. Could someone explain just exactly what that is? Yes, David could do that very well. He did that in our diligence call. Thank you. I'm so pleased that you asked that question. The European waterfall, unlike the American waterfall, requires that all the capital and the preferred return be returned to the LPs before the VP can get even a penny. So that extra 5% comes to us, generally speaking, in years 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, after we've returned everything to the LP. So we are, so to speak, way in the back of the bus. The American waterfall, which is classic in America, standard in America, allows the GP to participate in the economics at the same time as the LP. The European waterfall puts us in the back of the bus. We get zero until that 9% that Jim mentioned and everything else has been returned. And all the capital, 100% of the committed capital. 
Thank you very much for that explanation. Good observation. The impact, yeah, the impact on the returns is, is almost, it, it, it's in the second decimal point. Because these, the, the, the GP, the LPs get it on the front end and we have to wait till, you know, years 9, 10, you know, way, way out. We did this in order to find interests between the, us and the, and the LPs. Thanks for explaining that, David. Well done. Uh, we're starting to creep up on our time. Uh, so uh, any, any other observations? Uh, we have this slide up, up here again showing the track record of this manager in a diversified segment of uh, the, the market. That, that's uh, as Matt Roach mentioned, the portfolio fit is, is is very good for us. Hence, why we're trying to do this pacing and not a dollar more than our pacing uh, target. But we do want to bring you the best of the best, and we believe this is one of them. And they are working diligently at that uh, issue of uh, DEI. They're, they're committed. They put a professional on for that. I think you'll see uh, next fund significant progress being made there. So. With that, there's no other questions. I'll... Oh, Dan, you have your hand up again. Go ahead, Dan. I, I, yeah, this is discussion without any request, or um, I, I would just like to move into the discussion phase and being able to go between board members without necessarily Sentinel commenting. Um, so um, I, I believe that this is a very high carried interest with high fees. Our normal carried interest is 20%, and in fact, most of the deals we've done in the last several years have had carried interest of, of, of only 20%. Um, I, I have concerns about trust issues because there are material, they submitted questions to us. We asked them normal questions that we ask everyone else and they gave us answers that were not true. That is concerning to me, especially when in fact they had professionals on their staff for several months before this on this issue. Um, so I, 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 you know, it's not like they can even talk to us about when the last African American or Hispanic staff was on their, their staff. I mean, they, they just, it's, it, it's an issue of, um, it's an issue of when we ask questions, we expect consistent, honest, professional answers. And no one can read no one can read the answers that they provided on this topic and say that, that that is a professional firm, that you would want to invest someone thought that those answers on diversity were professional answers, the worthy of $100 million. So I, 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 there are other firms who can invest in this type of, of, of field. Um, with potentially lower fees and and who who have not given us answers that were materially uh, incorrect and so from a fiduciary perspective um, um, I, I, I you know I'm a strong no and and would urge other members uh, to, to, to do the same thank you thanks Dan chair Becker good um, can I uh, just thank ask you. a clarifying okay. question real quick? What what was materially incorrect that, that's a concern to you? Um, this is Dan Ocko. Um, yeah. We asked them if we asked, as our standard set of questions, uh, we asked if they had a um, mentoring program for women and minorities. And they checked yes. And then literally there's six sentences of word salad saying that they are good to their employees without mentioning a mentoring program, without mentioning uh, women or minorities. So the answers they submitted last night or this morning says, no, they do not have a mentoring program. So that they're hoping to get one at some point in the future. That is a material, um, that what they submitted was not correct. And, and, and you can plainly see that by the answer. That's why I asked um, on that. Okay, thanks, Dan. Yeah. Chair Becker. Thank you. But thank you. I think we've uh, had a, a good good conversation here. Uh, David, John, and uh, Dr. Mann, thank you uh, for your time and, and, and presentation. 
and I think it's time to uh, to go to a to, to a vote. And so I, uh, I I move that the investment committee recommend that the state employees retirement board one commit up to one hundred million dollars to Sentinel Capital Partner Seven LP and two commit up to $25 million to Sentinel Junior Capital II LP, plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with ex executed partnership documents as investments within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. It has been properly moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have uh, we have a motion and a second. Anyone on the question? Okay, yeah, babe, we have a roll call vote, uh, please, uh, Bill Trump. All right, Chairman Becker? Aye. Senator DeSanto? Aye. Mr. Philman. Aye. Mr. Rocco, on behalf of Senator of on behalf of Representative Frankel. He's not looking for a promotion, uh, no. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Mr. Lindsay, on behalf of Senator Hughes. Mr. Lindsay, on behalf of Senator Hughes, or Ms. Marchowski, on behalf of Senator Hughes? No. Who is, who is that? That's Ms. Marchowski, on behalf of Senator Hughes. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Ms. Vecchio, on behalf of Representative Schemmel. No. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. Uh, Secretary Thaw is not present. Mr. Flanagan, on behalf of Secretary Vig. Aye. Chairman, we have uh, seven yes, uh, three no. Great. Uh, thank you, Bill. And so uh, the motion is passed. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. That was a little longer than we anticipated. And, and thank you to Sentinel for all the work. And, and go do it again uh, like you did for Fun 5. Very much appreciated. Uh, moving on now, we are behind. We're going to move into the next opportunity, which is uh, item 5F, uh, private, equity private equity opportunity, Veritas Capital. Uh, oh, sorry, Mary. Uh, some of the uh, manager consultants are still on, and I just want to say I have expectations that Dr. Mann is going to do a good job going forward, and I think we all do. And I think thank we received a good message. That. Okay, thank, thank you for you. that, and thank you for all the feedback. We appreciate the dialogue and the feedback, and we want to keep doing better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your support. Yep. Thank you, David. Yep. And thank you, Mary, for positive comment. This very much appreciated. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll move on now to the next opportunity. Not trying to rush, but I am. Uh, 5F, private equity. Uh, we went through the pacing. Uh, Katie, if you could open up uh, that's the, slide, the CIO introduction slides for Veritas, please. Um, go to page three, and you'll see the same pacing chart, uh, again, in case somebody stepped out of the meeting and they came in, we put these in each one. So I won't go through it again. Uh, the next page, uh, page four in the bottom right corner, that's also identical to what you saw in the previous presentation. So we'll skip that too. 
and then uh, move on to page five. And this is different. Uh, the name, but as Matt Roach had indicated, the numbers are not too much different in terms of the quartile rankings and the significant returns. Uh, again, we pride ourselves in the investment office of trying to find the best of the best out there. We have a great consultant relationship that gets us there. Uh, we have more opportunities than we have dollars to put out with our focus on fewer, bigger funds. Uh, so we're being pretty choosy, but we are, we're looking for partners that are willing to work with us. And uh, this is one manager that, for some reason, got by all the previous teams here at CERS over the years, going back to 1997, the first fund, impeccable track record. And I got to give Matt Roach credit for bringing this to our attention. But you can see the incredible uh, high 20% on average across all funds, virtually all top quartile. In, in almost a, a de minimis uh, loss ratio. This, this is what we need. Now, this particular manager also offers us uh, some diversification uh, advantage. They, more, more than being into the software hardware business, in particular, like a couple of funds we've done earlier this year, these are technology enablers where they come in and make uh, their clients more effective uh, through the use of technology. And this is a very special group in this room, being that we're a government agency. They have a significant contribution to government agencies across the country, both at the federal level and in the state level municipalities all across the spectrum of government. So uh, they, they also were very instrumental in uh, bringing the uh, cybersecurity uh, market to to the forefront. Uh, that was per request from the U.S. government. Uh, so they, they had a head start on that and developed that out before uh, it really became a term and known in the industry. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask Matt Roach to once again cover the portfolio fit for this opportunity. And uh, then we'll turn it over to our new anticipated partners at Veritas. Uh, before we go, though, Katie, could you flip that one slide? Just want to clarify these, that Veritas is, again, in sync with our uh, transparency initiative 100% uh, across the board. So thank you for that. And uh, Matt, could you please give a portfolio fit up? They appreciate it. Yeah, I, I won't try to break up with this or it's just for the time now. Listen, like Sentinel, this is one of our highest conviction names among the handful. The, the consistency of the performance of the team, the track record um, is, is phenomenal. It's been a difficult, like Sentinel, act, difficult to access manager in terms of allocation. We're very pleased to be having this discussion and able to present, uh, have the Veritas team present to you um, now this afternoon uh, as, as we can just pass noon here. Um, makes sense again for the portfolio. Jim Jim talked about where the focus is different from other things that you, that you all are doing. Um, so maybe I will stop speaking very quickly and let the experts uh, begin the review. Back to you, Jim, to the Veritas. <clears throat> Sorry, Daniel Sugar is going to be leading the Veritas presentation. Dan, if you could take this away and introduce your team uh, and then go through your material. And again, we're running a little behind time, uh, but certainly make, make your points you want. But uh, uh, appreciate that being timely on that. If you could go ahead, please. Great. Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to present to you today. I'm one of the managing partners at Veritas, Hugh Evans, and I'm joined here by Dan Sugar, uh, one of our partners at Veritas. And uh, we're, we're uh, excited to walk you through uh, our firm today. Uh, Veritas Capital, we're based in New York City. Uh, and we have a differentiated uh, investment strategy and approach, as, as Jim alluded to is, in his uh, kind introduction. Uh, we have had a focus, long-standing focus, on investing in businesses at the intersection of technology and government. And uh, we've, we've been one unwavering and maniacally focused on uh, uh, 
staying focused on not doing what we do best and investing exclusively in businesses that provide services, software, solutions, and products, uh, primarily technology or technology-enabled solutions to government and commercial customers worldwide. Um, we have had this focus, and uh, no one else in the market, in the private equity world, has this unique focus. Um, we, due to our 25-year uh, track record in, in this space, we have now, uh, uh, 10 years ago, started being viewed in our space really as a strategic. Um, we have uh, a portfolio approach. We've been very successful in partnering many of our portfolio companies to work together to access new customers, new contract vehicles, um, and that has only reinforced our, reinforced our perception as a strategic in these markets. Uh, we compete primarily against strategics. Uh, there are other PE firms uh, who come in and come out, uh, may make one or two investments in the space. Uh, but we are the only firm, as I mentioned, who has consistently been focused on this space for, for 25 years. And what we've, what we've learned uh, over the last 25 years through mistakes. We've made mistakes. Um, I've made a lot, everyone here. But through those mistakes, uh, we can reapply those uh, lessons learned in future situations. And what we really strive at Veritas to do is get better and better and better. Um, as we've uh, uh, raised new funds and scaled our funds, uh, our returns have actually increased and got better over time. And I think that emphasizes uh, the benefit of that strategic focus. Um, obviously, what you're most interested, our LPs are most, most interested, first and foremost, is performance. Uh, there are obviously other considerations. Uh, but we're very proud of our track record, almost 25 years, 4.6 time gross MOIC, and a 44% net MOIC. But what we're almost uh, even more proud of, of is the fact um, uh, we have a less than 1% loss ratio. So very consistent returns uh, without volatility. And this has taken place over a long span of time that has seen us successfully invest, invest through uh, economic recessions and challenges, sequestrations, as well as uh, political changes and different parties uh, uh, controlling Congress or the White House. Um, and effectively, um, you know, while we invest in businesses that uh, many have large customer bases within the federal as well as state and local uh, governments, we're also very close to government, uh, not only current uh, officials, but ex-officials, CEOs within the industries. And we call it being, you know, the, the government is tipping the sp tip of the spear. The federal government is at the forefront of all the challenges facing not only uh, the government, but the citizenry and uh, uh, the enterprises of, of not only the United States, but the rest, rest of the world. And... You know, the U.S. federal government is the largest purchaser of IT services and software in the world, and it's also the largest investor in R&D uh, through multiple programs, uh, having spent about $165 billion alone last year across uh, R&D programs. Uh, so what does that really mean practically? It means by staying close and continuing our research and analysis, uh, to use a hockey analogy, we're able to have a better understanding of where the puck will be in the future, what those trends are. Jim alluded to uh, we were one of the first investors in cybersecurity before it was even called cybersecurity, which will be addressed in a few minutes by Dan. Um, but what we effectively try to do is identify uh, companies, um, in many cases corporate carve-outs, corporate or orphans, we just completed our 35th corporate carve-out. Um, and what we identify are companies that we can really transform. Um, you know, we have de we've developed a playbook over the years that we continually look to refine uh, to transform our companies through the identification of multiple value creation levers. 
primarily focused on organic uh, on, on a organic growth, uh, sales and marketing, BD, R&D, and we complement that with uh, uh, strategic M&A, sometimes large and transformational, but oftentimes can be very small add-ons uh, to effectively uh, fill technology gaps or provide access and calls to new customers. Um, stepping back on a macro basis, we're, you know, we're very proud of, of uh, and, and take it very seriously and are very passionate about our three main verticals, which are national security, uh, healthcare uh, software, and data analytics and education software and technology that are making a large impact uh, to our families, uh, your families, uh, Americans, as well as the spillover effect to, to other people in the world uh, to improve the positioning and the, the experience for, for all citizens within those, those three main verticals. And for instance, just to mention a couple, um, you know, Cambium, one of our portfolio companies is the largest digital curriculum provider uh, in the United States. It's, in particular, it serves over uh, 500 school districts in Pennsylvania alone. Um, for example, another company, software technology company called Gainwell, which is the leading provider of software and services to the Medicare and Medicaid infrastructure across the uh, United States. Um, we're very proud of the fact that uh, we're a key partner at Gainwell to the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health and Services, and as well to the uh, uh, the CHIP program, which is impacting the lives of over 100,000 uh, 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 children and, and teens uh, in providing and executing on the Medicare and Medicaid health that they uh, would otherwise not receive due to being uninsured. So this is, this is a, a mission that we're all very passionate about. Obviously, as I mentioned, a strong returns are, are obviously uh, uh, one of the top priorities in what we do for LPs, but we take a lot of uh, satisfaction and, and the team here uh, is very, very passionate about what our, what our mission is. And I'd also add that in what we do, uh, our reputation is number one uh, in terms of our uh, we view as our most important asset. Um, Dan, uh, our CEO, Ramsey Musalam, uh, uh, and many others here all have top security clearances given the, the work that we do in particular on the, the national security government services side of our investment business. And so, you know, we're, we're very used to uh, dealing with stringent uh, compliance protocols and procedures, uh, not only in what we do in terms of the investments uh, into portfolio companies we make, but personally, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely and, and, and number one for us. Um, and we have a, a, a non-tolerance policy here at, at uh, Veritas, as you can probably imagine, given the the type of work that we do. Uh, moving to page two, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're very proud of our, our track record. The only thing I'll point out on page two is uh, for for another year in 2022, Prequin uh, named us one of the top and most consistent bio fund managers in the industry. And we are also uh, um, humbly uh, you know, humbled by uh, the performance in particular of, of our most recent uh, 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 deeper vintage uh, 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 fund, Fund 6, which was ranked the top performing private equity fund uh, in the world uh, with a uh, 4.9 times MOIC and a 68% gross IR. And as you saw in Jim's uh, earlier slides, a 59% net IRR. Um, and again, we uh, we don't like to be average here. Uh, uh, you know, we strive to get better with every every fund. Uh, and as Jim and the team knows, that's and uh, since our inception, uh, the fund returns are continuing to increase. Uh, hey, hey, moving to page three. Hugh, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, we're running very behind on time. If you could, uh, you, you have a very good overview of, of the firm, and we talked about the returns. Uh, if you could hit the highlights uh, and, and wrap it up in here, here a couple of minutes so we can uh, keep, keep closer to time. Sure, appreciate it. 
Sure, page three, obviously, uh, very differentiated, obviously, our focus, our experience. We leverage our proprietary network of executives and, and uh, uh, intermediaries to identify opportunities that we can uh, 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 leverage with the Veritas playbook. I, I mentioned we kind of leverage our IP and have expanded that across not only the flagship, but the Vantage Middle Market Fund, as well as our credit platform. Uh, one stat uh, in Fund 6, we were looking at uh, maybe 350 deals a year. Uh, now we're seeing about 1,000. Uh, page 4, Jim, I kind of covered. Uh, it's a $2 trillion market we invest in, high barriers to entry, where the experience is critical to be able to be successful in this space and building value. Uh, and again, I mentioned the, the deep uh, focus on national priorities. With that, I'll turn it over, Dan, to cover the remaining few slides, given the time constraints. Yes, I'll, I'll try to be up. brief. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I think the key thing on slide five that's really critical is we're investing in these three you know, core areas as well as others that are absolutely mission critical. Uh, and not just mission critical in their ecosystems, but mission critical to society. And, you know, again, across cybersecurity, healthcare, information technology, and education technology, each of those, uh, again, are providing that level of technology, level of modernization to those ecosystems to advance the mission, whether it's better healthcare outcomes for less cost or better education outcomes, leveraging the latest and greatest technology to you know, deliver customized learning experience. Uh, and then, of course, cybersecurity, as we all know, is a major, major challenge. You know, if we flip ahead to page six, one of the key things that we think differentiates us, and this is really against the backdrop of really being very deep in our ecosystems, but it's really about, you know, applying the value creation levers to each and every one of the portfolio companies. And because we're so deep, we think we can do this very, very thoughtfully and have done so in the past. But really, it's around strategic repositioning, taking an asset, many times a corporate orphan, and repositioning it, investing heavily in business development, in R&D, in product development, to really help uh, take what is you know, a nice business and make it a great strategic business. And then lastly, it's really leveraging our overall network and power of the portfolio to um, really be a force multiplier in terms of... Um, in terms of creating the incremental value of the portfolio companies. And really, in the end, we think that that helps command absolutely premium exit values. And we're really proud of the fact, while we are fiduciaries and will, uh, you know, obviously maximize value to the highest payer, uh, highest paying buyer, uh, we are proud of the fact that we've exited uh, close to 70% of our uh, portfolio companies to strategics, really changing and really defining that re repositioning uh, from a factual perspective. You know, as we flip ahead and, and talk about team, this is something that's obviously really, really critical, and this is page seven. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, we have a really long tenured team. We've been together um, at Veritas and uh, in, in prior iterations in terms of knowing and working together, even at separate firms for a long, long time. The partners average 25 plus years of uh, experience in the ecosystem and in the industry. Additionally, we're really proud of our entrepreneurial culture, and that's really, really important to us. We really uh, take ownership. We have entrepreneurial backgrounds across a lot of the leadership at the firm and really, again, believe as investors, it's not just about being an investor, but really being an entrepreneur and having the full ownership of an outcome, good or bad, and, and as well as the bumps uh, in the road that come along. Um, additionally, as we think about our talent, um, we really are focused on kind of a twofold approach. First and foremost, growing our talent from within uh, and really, really bringing uh, folks along, even in some cases from the pre-MBA levels all the way up. In addition, we try to enhance the internal team through external hires. Uh, many of those folks have long-term relationships, having worked uh, across the table or in partnership with Veritas. But really the goal when bringing in external talent is to create that diversity, um, especially of perspective and of experience, to help drive the best investment outcomes. And so, you know, as we think about uh, the team, we're going to continue to enhance it, build from within, but also uh, aggressively look to, uh, to find uh, diverse candidates really, again, to, to provide the best 
investment judgment for the team. And then I'll go to the last slide. Again, I know I'm moving quickly. Um, really, there are two, 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 two main topics on this slide. One is uh, ESG, and the other one is DEI. You know, from an ESG perspective, we've been focused on ESG for a long time. Uh, the first formal policy was put in place in 2016, and we apply and have refined that policy, leveraging uh, expert partners, including Malk partners, uh, to help um, push down uh, the initiatives not only uh, at the Veritas level, but of course also at each portfolio company. And so they're inv involved at the diligence phase all the way through uh, our ownership to again, you know, try to um, expand and 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 keep uh, on track our goals from an ESG perspective. Um, additionally, from a DEI perspective, you know, we're proud to say that Veritas is a minority-owned firm. Um, and really, again, it comes back to that entre entrepreneurial uh, ethos that's really, really critical. Um, and in terms of our, our program, we really are focused on kind of three main parts of the initiative from a, from a DEI perspective. First is to attract, uh, and really that's creating the right uh, external um, perspective on Veritas, marketing ourselves, and creating the right recruiting pipelines uh, marketing ourselves and, and and tapping into the right types of candidates that again can provide that you know diverse perspective. Uh, additionally, it's investing, and there's two parts to that. That's kind of the in external part, uh, investing in partnerships, investing in our portfolio companies, into industry uh, organizations, and then obviously, very importantly, on an internal basis, investing uh, investing into our team and really creating the right framework for our teams to uh, excel and grow. And then the last part is really, you know, the measurement, um, making sure we're really monitoring and providing the right level of, uh, of transparency. And, you know, happy to say from a measurement perspective, 44% uh, of our private equity investment teams are ethnically diverse, and almost one-third of the firm is uh, is female, and you know we obviously can follow up with any uh, other details as needed. But realizing for time, maybe we'll end on that note. Thank you for your your time. Yes, thank you for uh, moving along a little bit quicker there. <laughs> our bad, but we do appreciate that. Uh, I don't see any hands raised at this point. Um, if there are questions, please please uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Just want to recap. Um, oh, treasurer. Treasurer has a question. Yep. Jim, this might be a question for you, and it's a really quick question, I promise. But are there parameters around that sidecar? Yes, I was just I was just about to recap that. I, I failed to introduce that at the beginning. So uh, the folks at Veritas, despite this being our first uh, fund with them, we asked them uh, if they would consider uh, a sidecar for us. And what that will do is significantly reduce the all-in cost for investing in this. We'll be able to participate in, in larger deals that they're going to uh, invest in that's uh, in excess of the total of the funds permitted to go into. We'll be able to take advantage of that at uh, significantly reduced economics, uh, which inerts to the fund's benefit. So thank you for asking that, Treasurer. That's a $25 million uh, sidecar, so it's significant alongside the $100 million in the fund. Any other observations, questions? Okay, so once again, we're bringing you a top-tier manager, our consultant believes. In fact, I've got to give credit to our consultant for bringing this to our attention. And uh, with that, Chair Becker, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, Stepstone and uh, Veritas team. Appreciate the very nice uh, presentation. And uh, I move uh, that the Investment Committee recommend that the State Employees Retirement Board commit, one, up to $100 million to the Veritas Capital Fund 8 LP, and two, up to $25 million to a sidecar vehicle that will co-invest alongside the Veritas Capital Fund 8 plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as investments within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required 
Commonwealth legal approvals been 12 months. It has been properly moved. Do we have a second? Second. Second, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Anyone on the question? Hearing none. Uh, uh, Bill, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Chair Becker. Aye. Senator DeSanto or Mr. Uh, Erdman on behalf of Senator DeSanto. Yes, this is Chuck Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Philman. Aye. Mr. Ocko. Aye. Thank you. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Ms. Marchowski. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Ms. Vecchio. No. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. Secretary Thaw is absent. Mr. Flanagan. Aye. Thank you. Uh, we have nine yes, one no, one absent. Chair. Okay. Right, thank you, Bill. So uh, thank you, everyone. Motion passes. Uh, Jim, I will turn it back to you for a final presentation. Okay, thanks, Chair Becker. And, uh, we will once again try to move this along as quickly. I'm cutting into lunchtime. I do apologize for that. But this is for a good cause, long-term compounding of capital for our members. Uh, we're going to go to 5G is in golf. I like that. Uh, and we're going to hear from Kathleen McCarthy today from Blackstone. Uh, before Kathleen starts, uh, if I could ask Katie to open up the CIO uh, introduction slides for the Blackstone Opportunity Fund. Uh, thank you, Katie. And if you could go to page three, we'll again touch on pacing uh, very briefly. This is real estate. We haven't covered that yet, so we'll take a minute with that. Uh, we work with our consultant, Matt Ritter, who you've heard from at NEPC, and they, they model out our contributions, distributions, et cetera, take into account our what we're targeting now, the $210 million, as you see in the legend down below it in the green line. That will leave us uh, slightly overweight in real estate if we continue to pace at this rate uh, out through 10 years from now. Uh, however, I will reiterate, we're going to uh, give you a chance to look at pacing, and, and uh, we, can, we can adjust that annually as we're going through this period. Um, Okay. okay, sorry, Chair. Okay, uh, so with that said, let's let's move on to the next page. Uh, you can see that uh, we have a target for this year of 150 million uh, because of a, a carryover from last year. Uh, before we get on to a smoother pacing target, uh, and we have uh, this one opportunity here targeted for 75 million at this point, and then we'll look for another opportunity or two to bring back to you at the remaining board meetings to hit that target. Um, so Matt Ritter's hard at work there uh, looking for the best opportunities for us. The next page is a recap of the history of Blackstone's real estate partner. This is a very blue chart in terms of the bars in blue our funds were in. As you can see, we've been in many of the funds, and you can see the returns um, have been uh, very attractive for us. Uh, once again, in real estate, we're trying to get that to not be a single-digit returning asset. Class, we want to get it up into the teens, and this manager certainly has done their share along the years, we just haven't had enough of opportunities like this. So uh, that's why we bring this one here to you today. And then, of course, uh, as you might expect, Blackstone on the next page is uh, in agreement with our transparency initiative for this fund and previous funds as well. And with that, if I could ask Matt Ritter to step up and talk about the portfolio fit for the real estate portfolio, which has changed quite a bit over the years, but Matt's been at the controls of that uh, shifting asset allocation, so he's the best to be able to tell us how this is going to fit for us with our new allocation that was approved the last board meeting going forward. So 
Go ahead, Matt. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll be pretty quick here. Um, just to reiterate a couple of things Jim said, uh, Blackstone is one of the largest and best performing real estate investors uh, that, that are out there. They've established a large experienced team uh, around the globe, and as Jim just highlighted, produced a very strong track record, uh, both on an absolute and relative basis. And I think, you know, I know Jim just talked about this, but I do think it's important to keep in mind the, the experience that Service has had with Blackstone over the years. Uh, in addition to the six prior BREP funds, which, which Jim talked about, um, SERS was also an investor in Blackstone's Core Plus Fund, Blackstone Property Partners. So I think from a portfolio fit standpoint, um, you know, this commitment or a potential commitment to BREP 10 really represents an opportunity for SERS to continue to build on an existing relationship with a top partner that has performed well for SERS in the past and the partner that we continue to have conviction in. Um, in terms of the impact on the portfolio, the fund is a global opportunistic strategy. It is expected to be diversified by across a variety of real estate sectors, as well as by geography, um, predominantly North America, but really true global exposure. So I think with that context, this is an investment that really should contribute both to the overall diversification of the SERS real estate portfolio, but also to the total return of the SERS portfolio. And then lastly, um, as we talked about earlier today, um, SERS did recently approve the change in the sub-strategy targets that included an increase in the target to value add an opportunistic real estate. So that target has gone up, um, and this fund is an opportunistic real estate fund. So it fits very nicely into that to help us build towards that new target. Um, and with that, if there aren't any questions, I will turn it back to you, Jen, to introduce oh. Blackstone. Okay, great recap there. Thanks for tying that into the new target asset allocation because that's what we're focused on going forward here. So appreciate that. And with that, Kathleen, if you could uh, take it away with uh, uh, the presentation. And thank you for all the meetings we had prior to this diligencing. I'm looking forward to the board hearing uh, all the fine stories as well. Please take it away. Well, excellent. Th thank you so much, Jim. Thank you also, Matt, for the introduction uh, and the contextualization of this opportunity. I'm delighted to be with all of you, although I'm a little concerned that I am the only thing standing between you and lunch. So uh, I will do my very best um, to be inside the 10 minutes I was guided toward. Um, and with that, if, if uh, we wouldn't mind going to slide one, um, this is that, uh, that global track record that you saw in Jim's presentation uh, and Matt's presentation just really updated for 331 numbers. And so as you can see, and as was discussed, uh, over 30 years, over $70 billion of capital invested for our BREP Global Fund investors. We have generated consistently strong performance, a 17% net IRR since inception. And I think, you know, importantly, there within this, what you can see is uh, in that second to the right column, a substantial amount of this capital has already been realized. So not just numbers on the page, but actually capital back to our investors completing the cycle of our work. And additionally, when you look at each of these different funds, including ones that were invested immediately prior to significant downturns, so whether it was BREP2 before the dot-com bubble burst, or BREP4 and 5 before the global financial crisis, or BREP8 right before COVID, each of these performed extraordinarily well, really meeting or beating our expectations and our targets for, for this strategy. Um, and that is really a testament to the discipline and consistency of our process. We describe ourselves as high conviction thematic investors. We'll talk more about what that looks like in this environment, but really seeking sectors and geographies for our investments that we think can outperform uh, expectations of the broader market in terms of overall cash flow growth, because we find that when we invest where real estate fundamentals are strong, but maybe more importantly, where the real estate we invest in is benefiting from broader mega trends that are propelling demand, uh, we can generate consistently strong outcomes with our investments. Um, and again, and just to tie back to what was said, you know, I heard that comment about um, trying to move your real estate portfolio to really be focused into double digit returns. And again, I think this strategy and our track record shows we could be a big part of that. So um, the next couple of pages just kind of drive a little deeper into the more recent funds, um, Rep 8 and Rep 9, which unfortunately um, you are not in. But if you look at page two, um, this uh, to me, obviously terrific 
performance numbers on here, but maybe most importantly, again, what, what we think is propelling this kind of performance, a 47% net IRR, 13 billion of gain, is that thematic sector concentration. So our four um, uh, most, most prevalent sectors in our portfolio overall, and in this fund in particular, would be logistics, which is benefiting from two mega trends today. One is the continued penetration of e-commerce, but additionally, really all over the world, we see businesses reshoring, nearshoring their merchandise, trying to build up inventory, you know, really in response to all of the dislocation we've experienced in the last couple of years, and we continue to experience in this inflationary environment. Those two powerful forces are propelling demand for logistics globally, and we've been the biggest investor in that really since the financial crisis. Additionally, rental residential, um, which you know, the fundamentals are, been, remain very strong globally, really because there has been insufficient amounts of new supply created over more than a decade. Uh, and as more people are looking to rent and rent longer, uh, we see that benefiting rental residential in a lot of different forms of housing. Uh, hospitality as well, a high conviction theme, also an area where we have been a very experienced investor since our founding in 1991. Um, there has, was an interruption during COVID, of course, but really we think we've been on a long-term trend line of greater and greater demand for high quality hospitality experiences. Uh, and our focus in particular has been more on the luxury and resort destination kind of experiences in supply constrained locations. And then also uh, hospitality assets at the other end of the spectrum where we can offer a really affordable, high-quality vacation. Investments like Great Wolf Lodges is one example of that, um, but also extended stay hotels um, where it's an extended stay product frequently for a business travel or temporarily in a location. Um, and we see strong de demand dynamics kind of at both of those ends of the spectrum. And then finally, life science. Um, this is a segment of the office market, a specialized segment of the office market, um, where we initially invested behind this because this, this strategy um, at a time when it was considered contrarian, uh, because we saw what was happening in terms of the revolution in the way science was being developed in order for us to care for our bodies differently, not only using pharmaceuticals, um, but immune therapies, genomics, um, lots of actually data science behind it as well. And we saw that happening increasingly in a couple of key nodes where all of the talent wanted to be. And so by by picking a subsegment of the office market that we very tremendous performance in our in our investment portfolios. Um, Brep 8 had a very similar experience if we go to slide three. Also here, uh, 19 billion of gain on 17 billion of invested capital, and propelled by concentration in logistics, residential, hospitality, and life science. Um, moving forward to page four, we tried here just to simply summarize what we see as our key competitive advantages. And so much of this really comes back to, I'd say, the, the scale of both the capital and the team we have, and then also this thematic approach and dedication to value creation. So just ticking down, and I'll talk about it further when we get to the next slide. Our portfolio and our scale as the largest real estate owner and investor gives us a powerful information advantage. We have a heritage of mining our portfolio for information on what is happening on the ground in real estate assets and markets, and then using that to make great decisions for how we deploy capital when we sell assets, and then also how we drive value creation along the way. And that that is really intentional. It's really it's a part of our heritage, not a new habit that we're forming. Um, we always we always take this growth orientation. We're trying to find assets and sectors where we think we can can propel strong revenue growth, which then comes to the bottom line in the form of cash flow. And we do that by investing in themes that we think are benefiting from mega trends around the world that are playing out in favorable ways for the real estate asset classes we like that I described a couple pages ago. Um, we have a real talent advantage in our minds uh, in terms of the team and the capital they have to go deploy into great opportunities when they find them. And then finally, we don't lose sight of the fact that it's not just about buying great real estate at good values, but it's what you do over your whole period. Uh, in the BREP funds, we have a uh, typically five years or less, so it'll be our whole period. And during that time, we want to have a transformational impact. Thank you. Good. Moving me on to the next slide is perfect. Um, this is page five, um, really tries to show kind of the, this network effect in action. $550 billion of assets across 12,000 individual assets in 37 countries. We have our team of nearly 800 professionals, but they're working in concert constantly with 54 portfolio companies 
that are really best in class teams focused specifically on sectors and geographies. And all of that information, all that insight, all that experience benefits a single global investment process where we make decisions through a consistent lens, regardless of where we're investing in the world, the US, Europe, or Asia, or uh, which sectors we want to make sure that every dollar capital we deploy, it's best possible opportunity. And we want to use all of that information we have, which others do not have to our advantage. Um, page six, um, you know, touches on the environment we're in. So um, I think, you know, for so for us and, and for all investors today, uh, we have to be mindful of what is happening in a rising rate environment where we're experiencing inflation that we at Blackstone believe uh, will be more persistent. And I think the great news for us as real estate investors and for all of you as well is that Overall, real estate has performed well in rising rate environments and where we feel inflationary pressures. Now, not all real estate performs the same, and this is why you do have to pick your spots, in our minds, be thematic by sector. Because if you look on the right side of this slide, you can see that you're notwithstanding that real estate net operating income overall could outpace U.S. CPI over a long period of time. If you look on the right, you see real dispersion in terms of whether you picked logistics, which has been our biggest theme, 40% of our portfolios in logistics versus shopping malls where you actually saw an NOI degradation. So real estate overall acts as an inflation hedge as as rents rise. If you have short duration leases, as we do in the sectors we, we focus on, you can capture that rent growth. You also tend to have lower input costs versus certain other types of asset classes um, in the real estate space. But you do have to pick your spots wisely, um, particularly in an environment, I think, like this. On page seven, uh, this goes back to the different themes that we like, that we think um, are poised to perform well in the environment we're in. And these have been our themes, as I mentioned, for a, a number of, of years now, BREP 8, BREP 9. And I would expect you can you would continue to see us uh, activating on opportunities across logistics, rental housing, and hospitality as we head into, in, excuse me, investing BREP 10. Um, you know, one thing just about you know how our approach to investing, particularly given the size of our funds, um, is we do try to focus on larger, more complicated situations um, so that really we can be transacting in places where there's less competition. I would never say no competition, but there might be less competition. Um, and our view always is we want to get to the best real estate we can in the sectors we like. But fortunately, we have this 30 years of experience. We've done nearly 50, take privates. We can use that really to buy assets and by companies in ways that sometimes others may not be able to compete. And of course, again, the capital we have, which allows us to speak with speed and certainty and, and make good on commitments we make to sellers, you know, helps a lot. And there's a, a number of different examples of this on this page. Um, and, you know, but, but in each of these situations, what I would say is that our experience in transacting in large complicated situations paired with the amount of capital our investors entrust with us allowed us to access great quality real estate that again, others might have seen the opportunity there, but very few could really activate for their investors. On um, the next page, page eight, you know, talks about just how do we respond in an environment like this where there's a lot of volatility. And I would say the great news, what we get excited about is these are the kinds of moments where we really shine. Again, that expertise, that capital, this shows really going back to the period of time coming out of the financial crisis, how each time there was volatility in the market, we've really been able to activate to buy great companies uh, you know, that, that I think others would have had a harder time accessing. And even most recently, you can see with Extended Stay America or Crown Resorts in Australia, um, when the markets are more uncertain, this tends to create interesting opportunities. And the nature of our experience and our capital allows us to access those for the benefit of our investors. And so uh, volatility is certainly concerning to some investors, actually you know, energizing for us in terms of the opportunities I think it will help create for BREP10 investors. Finally, um, on our investments, and then we'll move to ESG. If we go to page nine, um, we never lose sight of our job of sending capital back to you. The work is not done until the capital goes back uh, for the benefit of the folks you serve. And so you can see here just over the last five years, um, incredible discipline. And even through the COVID period, with our ability to generate over $40 billion of realizations in the prep funds uh, since COVID began, $166 billion since inception uh, for us, again, it's trying to complete that circle of our work and make sure you get the, the capital back uh, so that you can use it for the beneficiaries of your plan. 
Um, finally, I will um, touch on ESG, um, and then I'm excited to open it up to questions. If you go to page 11, because I think we have to click through a, um, a cover page, um, you know, I, I would start by saying that one of the, the things about our approach to ESG is that we view it as completely integrated with the excellence we're trying to deliver as investors. These, this is ESG uh, is not running counter to our work as investors driving great outcomes. Uh, they work together. And our program is really focused on three key pillars, good governance and transparency of what we're doing around everything, but including what we're doing in ESG to drive great outcomes. Two is decarbonization and three is diversity. Um, in, I'll, I'll focus for a second on decarbonization and diversity. Um, we have set ambitious targets and have, and I say, an action orientation toward reducing carbon emissions. Our firm at the firm level has targeted reducing 15, excuse me, carbon emissions by 15% in all of our new controlled investments. We are getting after that um, through what we call the carbon reduction hierarchy, starting with operational issue, uh, oper uh, operational matters that are easier to implement, moving through capital investments, and then finally to how we source that energy. And you can see here um, some uh, spot, a place where we were able to install solar panels on warehouses. Um, in diversity, um, I think about this work is as fortunately moving so far beyond just what we can do at Blackstone. It, as I mentioned Blackstone Real Estate has 800 professionals, um, but it, it's not just about what we can do with our own team. It's what we can do through those 54 portfolio companies to really transform businesses and industries in terms of the composition of the leadership and the opportunity you're creating for people who are, who are trying to get on the career ladder or move up in their careers. So I, you know, I'm, we are not where we want to be really in terms of decarbonization or diversity. We are so much more opportunity ahead, but I am really proud that with the focus we've brought to this, um, a third of our boards are, are comprised of diverse professionals. A third of the leadership team of our firm um, is diverse um, with actually 50% of our major businesses being led by a diverse professional. Also, we've created programs like Career Pathways which is really helping people from underrepresented groups and comp and and uh, underserved backgrounds get on that first step of the career ladder through our portfolio companies to really enhance not only their own career prospects but really the economic mobility of their entire community. And then additionally, as we've approached you know hiring, we we focus on women and diverse professionals at the top you know at the at the very entry level. Our analyst program last year uh, was 40% female globally in the U.S. Uh, 49 percent diverse and 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 actually at the senior level which is sometimes hard a harder place to move the needle um, 50 percent of our senior hires in real estate last year were women 60 percent ethnically diverse and we just we keep at this work um, and again I think for me and for my colleagues what's so exciting about what we're doing not only in diversity but really across ESG as I said it's not just what we can do as Blackstone, but what we can do in partnership with the portfolio companies we control all of whose goals mirror our own. Um, so with that, I will pause. We'd love to open it up to questions if there are any. Now you can take a breath. Thank you for moving that as quickly as you did. It was very, very informative uh, and, and moved along nicely. I don't see any hands up at this point. And okay. So with that, uh, turn this back to Chair Becker. Okay. Thank you, Jim. And. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for an excellent presentation. And you can exhale now. So you're, and um, I think you've done this before. And uh, thank you for the thank you for the uh, the good performance you've uh, provided uh, over the past few funds we've been in. Uh, so we're ready uh, for a motion. I move that the investment committee recommend that the state employees retirement board commit up to seventy five million dollars to Blackstone Real Estate Partners ten LP plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as an investment within the real estate asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiation and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. It has been properly moved. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Anyone on the question? Hearing none, could we have a roll call uh, vote, please, Bill? Yes. Chair Becker. Aye. Mr. Erdman. Aye. Mr. Philman. Aye. 
Mr. Rocco. Aye. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Is it uh, Mr. Lindsay now on behalf of Senator Hughes? Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Ms. Vecchio. Aye. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. Mr. Thaw, Secretary Thaw is absent. Um, Mr. Flanagan. Aye. Chair Becker, we have 10 yes, one absent. Great, thank you. Uh, motion passed. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Jim, I will turn it back to you for a quick wrap up. Okay, thanks, Chair Becker. Uh, we do have one final item, uh, 5H. This is not a, a motion item. Kathleen, thank you very much uh, for, for your presentation. I'm sorry we're rushing. Uh, but 5H is the next uh, item, and this is the board consultant evaluation uh, process that came out of a funds and recommendation. So, Katie, if you could open up our live stream presentation under 5H, you'll see that Funston recommendation to review the performance of all outside advisors on a consultant schedule, uh, on a regular, uh, let, let me restate that, outside advisors, in particular consultants within the investment office, uh, and, and to annually discuss and uh, show results to the board and uh, ensure that uh, your expectations are being met. Uh, we're happy to say in our investment office, you'll see in board docs, uh, item again under 5h uh, sample tracking list uh, that's not a live stream document but that that is in there for your convenience just to show what we already are doing in the investment office and have been doing uh, since I joined the system uh, this is something I felt was important to do uh, to have specific measurable I, I think it was Joanne Collins that said uh, what gets measured gets managed and that keeps coming around as we're having these conversations uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, Stepstone, NEPC, Cal, and all our consultants. Uh, we have specific deliverables on the board materials that you're all seeing today. For example, the regular monthly reporting, quarterly reporting, annual reporting, and so forth. So that's all going on. But we wanted to have a discussion here today to see if there was any particular uh, issues that anyone has at the moment with our consultants and how we're tracking them. And we, we do anticipate coming in at uh, probably the last our last meeting of the year. I think I think our procedures uh, Chris has developed maybe towards the beginning of the year. We'll recap everything that we tracked and share it with the board. And we think that's a great opportunity for you when you're looking at that track record to express any interest in things that you want to see modified or. Uh, we think you'll be pretty happy, actually. They're, our consultants hit on all the marks on a regular basis. But any anybody have any questions or thoughts about the material here in board docs? Uh, do I see any hands? No, I don't at this point. So you'll be hearing from us with the first annual report late this year, right at the turn of the year. Uh, we'll bring that to you and, and finish this process. So it's a good initiative, good recommendation by Funston, and uh, good shepherding of the process through the system by Chris Houston on his uh, last board meeting. So thank you, Chris. A uh, couple of informational items under 5I. For your convenience, the asset allocation report, as always, and the funds and recommendation update that uh, one of them we just covered there. But that's that's a recap for your uh, enjoyment uh, with updates. And then finally, in the executive material, as we do quarterly performance reporting with our consultants, they provide uh, the evaluation lists uh, on the managers, uh, it's confidential information, so that's not into the uh, live stream material, but that's there for your convenience. And with that, Chair Becker, uh, that takes us through the entire agenda. Thank you. Okay, good, thank you. I think um, our business is uh, finished here. And any questions, concerns, comments by members of the committee or, or the board? If done, uh, our 
next meeting is scheduled for July 18. And uh, I move that uh, this meeting of the investment committee uh, be adjourned. Can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.